All right, here we go. Thanks. Okay, folks, here we are. It's uh, all the president's pets, White House animals and their families. So, uh, but it's really mostly about the animals. But, uh, you know, I try to call them pets in chief. And just about every president and his family have owned a first pet. And this is their story. This is a wonderful picture of uh, President Harding being greeted by Laddie Boy on the, the North Portico. He just returned from Florida. It's a government photograph and it's 1923. So this is actually well, probably one of the very last pictures of the president with his dog because he went on a trip to the West Coast in Alaska and unfortunately he died in office. So there weren't too many more pictures after this. And uh, even though George Washington didn't live in the White House, I thought I should in include him. And he had all these different kinds of pets. And uh, while he was president, they had Mrs. Washington's Polly the Parrot. But another interesting thing was that in his words, in the, uh, he said he wanted to breed a dog that was a superior dog, one that had speed, sense, and brains. So he got a gift from the Marquis de Lafayette of uh, a, a breed called the Grand Blue de Gascoigne. And he bred it with his brown and tan hounds. And he's the only president ever to have created a new breed called the American Foxhound. Uh, some of his other interactions with his animals wasn't quite so good as that uh, because Martha went on ahead to open Mount Vernon when his term as president ended. And uh, he was left with the task of packing everything up in Philadelphia. And uh, he was so besieged by all these instructions from her about how to deal with this, that, and every other thing, including the animals. And he said that, uh, that on one side, I am called upon to remember the parrot on the other to remember the dog. For my own part, I should not pine much if both were forgot. Now Jefferson, he had uh, several mockingbirds and actually two uh, bear cubs. And the bear cubs were a gift from Zebulon Pike of Pike's Peak fame. And according to Mr. Pike, he said that they were much feared in that part of the country and the natives considered them the fiercest animal on the North American continent and definitely much different than bears found in the East. But uh, although Jefferson really liked his gift, he said that uh, in a letter to his granddaughter, he mentioned the arrival of the cubs from Pike and stated flatly, these are too dangerous and troublesome for me to keep. So they got packed off the Peels Museum in Philadelphia. So much for the bear cubs. Uh, John Quincy Adams has the honor <laughs> of uh, having the weirdest pet in the White House. The Marquis de Lafayette gave him an alligator. 
and <laughs> the president had installed a bathroom because the house had been built without any and he delighted in getting guests in to check out the new bathroom, little realizing that there was an alligator in the tub. <laughs> so he thought that was a lot of fun. And Andrew Jackson had, you know, he bought horses, he had a parrot, a whole bunch of other animals, and he bought them mostly from his home in the Hermitage in Tennessee. And I think there was a really good reason for that because his beloved wife, Rachel had just died. She lived long enough to see him elected, but she died soon after. And I think having all these animals sort of made him feel a little bit less lonely in, in this because, uh, you know, we're used to seeing the White House as a very good sized structure, but for 95 years, it was actually the largest private home in North America. And uh, it was really sort of cavernous <laughs> to these early presidents. Now, Martin Van Buren, he actually got two tiger cubs. So that's numbers two <laughs> in the weirdest pets in the White House. And this, he had a monumental uh, fight with Congress because members of Congress claimed that the uh, cubs were sent as a gift to President Jackson, who was no longer in office, but the president countered with that they were addressed to the president of the United States, which he now was. And so that was that. However, they couldn't stay as they started getting bigger. So they wound up going uh, to the National Zoo, which had been recently established. So there, there we go, but uh, that must have been fun. I would love to have seen the correspondence on that. Sorry, we just sort of jumped ahead a bit. Come on, back, 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 back. Okay, John Tyler, he had this actually beautiful dog, an Italian greyhound, and nobody in Washington had ever seen that. And uh, his mother-in-law received them in New York and she wrote that when she sent them on that while she had the great regard for him because uh, his name was Le Beau for beautiful one, she would not keep him as a pet. <laughs> and his wife, Julia, even wrote that uh, he was quite a challenge uh, with the, the carpets and the furniture because he was very high strung. And, but she, actually said she liked him very much. So he managed to find his place in Washington. No, 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 back, back. There we go. Okay, Millard Fillmore was sort of interesting because, you know, as things were intensifying between the North and the South, which eventually led to the Civil War, as you can see the dates, he was president 1850 to 1853. And, uh, he named one horse Mason and the other Dixon for the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, uh, one other thing about him is that he actually set up a local chapter of the newly formed ASPCA. And uh, he actually managed to get the first, uh, you know, animal welfare law passed in the United States. Uh, so because it had never been a law that you couldn't treat an animal as cruelly as you wanted to. So he was, he, so the animal rights movement in this country sort of basically started with him. Uh, now Abraham Lincoln bought two young boys. He actually had four sons and his oldest son, Robert was actually grown when he entered the White House, but Willie and Tad were about 11 and nine. So they loved playing all around the mansion. And they actually had two goats, Nanny and Nanko. And uh, one of the things that they would do is that they got together these old chairs and made them into improvised carts and had the goats run roughshod through the lobbyists in the White House waiting to see their father. And uh, Tad would be yelling, out of the way there. <laughs> So that caused a little bit of disruption. 
but uh, the president was a very indulgent father, so he, he actually liked to, to see them do that. And here's something, not exactly pet, but still sort of animal related. And uh, Lincoln inherited an offer from the King of Siam from the Buchanan administration, who, who King Moncut, who was the king and the king and I, and uh, he uh, actually had to write to the king explaining why they couldn't have them in the United States. And what he said was that, okay, he says our political jurisdiction, however, does not reach a latitude so low as to favor the multiplication of the elephant and steam on land as well as on water has been our best and most efficient agent of transportation and internal commerce. However, the US Army experimented with camels and uh, there's actually even an old Western song called High Jolly because they had, a, of course, a camel jockey <laughs> named uh, Haj Ali and they called him High Jolly and he just lived, I mean, everybody in the Southwest knew about him and he's running around with his camels for years. And uh, Tad actually begged his father to save uh, a turkey that had been bought for the Thanksgiving dinner. So his father actually wrote out an actual pardon and uh, the turkey was named Jack. And in the 1864 election, someone jokingly asked Tad if uh, the turkey, if Jack was going to vote for his father. And uh, Tad probably replied, he's not old enough yet. Now, these were photographs taken after Lincoln's death of his favorite pets. His horse, Old Bob, was the, the horse he rode the circuit with when he was a lawyer going from place to place and trying cases. And uh, Fido was uh, the dog that they decided to leave behind in Springfield. So he never actually got to Washington. But uh, they were all, these photographs were taken for the brig. Uh, funeral procession in Springfield, roughly about 20 days after the president was assassinated. Now, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, his oldest son, Jesse Root Grant, uh, actually owned Gamecocks on the White House grounds, which, I mean, that's illegal today, but it still was legal back then. And uh, Nellie Grant is uh, astride one of their horses and they, they had two ponies. And uh, so this was print was done about 1869, 1870 when they first came into office. And of course, a big part of White House life in those days were the stables and they were on the South Lawn. If you notice, you could see the mansion right behind them. And uh, you know, they were a collection. Some horses were bought from home. Some horses were actually provided by the government. And uh, they all lived there. And of course, upstairs lived the, the stable boys who took care of them. And uh, their era ended in uh, when President Taft took office because he was the first president ever to go to his inauguration in a motor car. And pretty soon after that, the stables became a garage. Now, uh, President Hayes had uh, the first Siamese cat in America. It was the, the American ambassador to Siam Center, and uh, they called her Siam. And there's this little picture here, the president and his family. And down here, you see the cat. So that's where it all started from. If you like, if you like Siamese, that was the first one. And uh, President Garfield, he had a bit of a sense of humor. He had, uh, he had so many problems with Congress that he named his Newfoundland dog Vito. <laughs> uh, 
Now, Benjamin Harrison, they had a goat cart for their grandchildren. That's them on the White House lawn with the uh, someone to make sure that they didn't get into trouble. And as you could see, this was the portico without the balcony, which the Trumans actually installed. But this was how the South Front actually looked. And actually, that was meant to be the original uh, the entrance to the mansion. But somehow, organically, the north side seemed to be more favorable, and that's what they did. But I thought that was cute. You just imagine being a kid, you know, being pulled around in that thing. <laughs> and I like this picture of Archie Roosevelt. Uh, that's his pony, Algonquin, and he's in front of the Department of War building, which is still there. It's called the old executive office building now. And it's right across the street from the White House. And you could actually get back and forth. They actually have a tunnel <laughs> from one building to the other. So you don't have to go out into the street. And they've actually closed um, East Executive Avenue to regular traffic anyway. But uh, he had a lot of uh, 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 fun on that horse. And the most memorable thing that involved uh, Algonquin was that uh, uh, Archie was down with the measles and he decided he asked his mother if he could go down to the stables to see his beloved Algonquin and his mother said no he was not well enough yet but uh, his brothers with possible connivance from some of the staff managed to bring Algonquin to Archie by using the White House elevator. <laughs> And um, the president's oldest daughter, uh, Alice Roosevelt, she actually carried a garter snake in her purse. And I mean, she would just open it and let it slither out at people. I mean, I'm, I'm sure, you know, that wasn't too cool for some people because, you know, some people are just absolutely scared of anything that looks like a snake. But she had an interesting name. She called it Emily Spinach. And I mean, you know, with five children, that was, I mean, they were perfect fodder for the press of the day. And uh, this is uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, with his pet macaw in the conservatory, which used to adjoin uh, the East Room. And uh, that, that was torn down later on. And there's this thing from newspaper about Quentin. He has a smash up with his goat and it's an animal leaps down steps dragging the wagon and the president's son. So it says here that the policeman, the butler and the dozen tourists rushed to the rescue. Quentin scrambled to his feet and inquired if the goat had been heard. He paid no attention to the scratch across his own face. He likes that goat. And this is sort of an unusual the pet. Uh, President uh, Howard Taft had a pet cow named Pauline. And there she is in front of the Department of War building, just like Algonquin was. And she just walked around the grounds. <laughs> and, you know, she had 17 acres worth of grass to chew on. So she was perfectly happy. And I'm sure they probably used her milk in the kitchen. Now, this was sort of interesting because, you know, technically they were not pets, but the Wilsons kept sheep during the First World War so that their groundsmen could enter military service. So here's a whole herd of sheep right there on the South Lawn, and they uh, mowed <laughs> the lawn and then later provided their wool for uh, the American Red Cross. And the Coolidge's, uh, they actually were sent uh, a raccoon for Thanksgiving dinner by an admirer, but they were so struck by her intelligence, they decided to keep her. And somebody asked the president that if, if, if raccoon was good to eat, and he said, it might be for some, but not for me. <laughs> 
And uh, here's, uh, the, they were also equally no newsworthy, the Coolidge's. And uh, so the president and Mrs. Coolidge are fond of pets and had a great variety during their stay in the White House. Dogs, cats, raccoons, and a wallaby. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the, like I said, Americans take this very seriously. They like to have presidents with pets. They like reading about them. And even presidential advisors say you really should definitely have a pet. Now, uh, the Hoover, uh, they found this pet, uh, this possum on the grounds. And so they just decided to keep it in a little hutch on the grounds. And nobody knows who these young men were, but what they did is that uh, they found a school, high school in Maryland that had lost its possum before the big game, which was their ma mascot. So the White House graciously lent Billy Opossum <laughs> to them. And they believed that these men were somehow associated with that school. But uh, it, it, like I said, it's, it is a government photo, but nobody really knows who they were. All right, uh, now Franklin Roosevelt, they had a whole bunch of pets, but the most famous one was Fala. The, that was his black Scotty dog. And this picture was really funny because in 1941, uh, Fala just thought it was perfectly fine for him to join his master for his swearing in. So he's sitting there in the, the first lady's place in the limousine. And he was supposedly quite miffed when a secret service agent unceremoniously <laughs> took him back inside the house. And uh, this is a famous speech. Uh, see if I can get the link going uh, uh, that he made about Thala. Nope, it's unavailable. Sorry about that. But I do actually have the text. And the whole thing uh, happened because uh, somebody dreamed up this thing in, in the opposing party that uh, Fala had been left behind on the Aleutian Islands and that the president sent a destroyer. And in the speech, he said, that it was a two million, three million, five million, twenty million dollar trip to retrieve Fala, and uh, I mean he was such a celebrity in his own right that uh, even though they had several other dogs, uh, and he was he was one, and the president's cousin Daisy Suckley, that was her job to take care of Fala, and she usually had to answer five boxes of mail a week that Fala got, not the president, not the first lady, but Fala. And uh, so he was, he was quite a popular dog. In fact, actually a little too popular because this is the clipping I found in 1944. And it said a clipping, no pun intended, but it just shows you how popular. And it said Fala gains weight and loses hair. And this is from Honolulu. And it said, the President Scotty and constant companion had the dog on this trip to Hawaii, what with being Shanghai and losing much of his long black hair to souvenir seeking sailors. No sooner had the President uh, Cruiser carrying the party left when a group of sailors Shanghai fell and began clipping his hair. He finally got away from them, but looking as if he'd gone to sleep in a barber's chair. <laughs> They also had another interesting thing, the family, because their dogs, of course, would play around on, on the lawn. And some dog who lived nearby somehow managed to get himself onto the grounds. And he's, he's playing with all the other dogs. And when they found him, they found his collar had a, 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 an address, a owner's name and address. So they, they actually sent him home in a White House limousine. But the dog kept coming back. And every time he was found on the grounds, they would just simply call the owner. He's here, come and get him. <laughs> now, Harry Truman got into sort of a, a problem because uh, he was given this gift 
of this spaniel puppy and uh, named Filler. And as you see, it was addressed, Harry S. Truman to White House, Washington, D.C. But uh, he and Mrs. Truman, for one reason or another, decided not to keep him. So, I mean, he did the right thing. He, he actually gave him to a friend of his who was a vet. And the vet took Feller. But, I mean, this really got up a lot of Americans very upset. I mean, the White House was besieged with letters saying, you know, why did you give away the dog? <laughs> I mean, they, it, it's like this thread through American society about, you know, presidents have to have pets. In fact, actually, Calvin Coolidge actually said that, you know, a, any any man who doesn't like animals and doesn't want them to have them around shouldn't be president of the United States. <laughs> oh, and Dwight Eisenhower, he had a beautiful Weimar honor named Heidi, but Heidi didn't stay too long in the White House. And there's a reason why, because uh, the Trumans had uh, gone through a massive renovation between 1948 and 1952 to reinforce the structural integrity of the White House, which was in very bad shape. And uh, uh, they put back a lot of things, like they took down the ma original mantelpieces and restored them. And a, a good deal of the original mansion is pretty much intact. But there were a lot of things that had to be brand new. And one of them was a, a carpet for uh, the diplomatic reception room. And that's the room where you, when people are on ground level on the South Lawn and a, a limousine with a head of state comes out and you know they greet them and then they walk in those doors. That's the diplomatic reception room. Anyway, Heidi had an accident on the brand new carpet. It was only like three or four years old. It cost thousands to replace because it's right under the blue room. So it's a good sized room. And so unfortunately, Heidi had to be banished to their uh, Gettysburg farm. And now uh, John F. Kennedy, I mean, the family had cats, hamsters, parakeets, a rabbit, but they're known most especially for their horses. And this is Caroline on her horse, macaroni, as in Yankee Doodle, following her father. And once again, you see the old Department of War, and now the old executive office building in the background. And uh, they actually wanted to, animals they had was a gift from the key to Khrushchev. It was just a little ball of fluff called Pushinska. And so anyway, this this is like, you know, Cold War paranoia at its height. The CIA insisted that they had to examine the dog in Walter Reed Hospital to make sure he wasn't, he didn't have listening devices. <laughs> I mean, just think, think on that. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know what they did with this dog. I mean, I guess they could only x-ray him. And I remember this distinctly when I was in school, in, in high school, because uh, Johnson showed uh, he's picking up his hound dogs, <laughs> the beagles by the ears. And, uh, you know, you could see everybody standing around him. They got that sort of rictus style, like, you know, <laughs> I don't want to be here. And uh, it says here, I've never heard it said that this was good for Beagle, said John Neff, executive vice president of the American Kennel Club. So the president got a lot of bad flack, you know, thousands of letters, bad press all over. But in a better moment, here he is at his desk with uh, one of his other dogs to doing a howling duet. <laughs> and this is sort of interesting because, you know, he never lived in the White House and the Nixons had other pets, but he's the one most closely associated with Nixon because 
he gave rise to the famous checker speech when he was uh, running for vice president and he almost got dropped from the ticket because he was thought to have received gifts uh, illegally. And uh, so he went on, his, his is, uh, is, and he's talking about the only gift he ever got was this dog, which his daughters adored. And uh, he, and he's, he also went on to say that my wife does not own a fur coat. She wears a good Republican cloth coat. <laughs> so that literally saved his political career. And Gerald Ford is posing with his dog Liberty in the Oval Office. And of course, if you remember the Saturday Night Live show when they started, they had Chevy Chase, you know, uh, and a stuffed dog, and he'd say, you know, Liberty, sit, and it would be <laughs> because it couldn't move; it wasn't alive. So they got they made the most out of that. Now with Carter, they actually had a border collie mix named Grits. And uh, because he was actually born on election day of 1976 and the Carter saw the, and here he is with Amy as sort of a, a reflection of their Southern heritage, where they came from. And uh, Ronald Reagan, here he is with his two favorite pets. And uh, this was his, his horse named Old Man and uh, his dog that, uh, according to Nancy Reagan, uh, he started out as the ball of fluff and then got as big as the sofa. But uh, he, uh, the president actually loved them and uh, he was an accomplished horseman and uh, he actually was our very last president to be so. And now after Fala, Millie <laughs> became the most famous White House dog. And uh, so, uh, and she had, was considered she an author. And you may perhaps recall Millie's book, which actually hit the New York Times bestseller list. And I know back then every library had to have it. So we did, everybody got it. <laughs> And here's uh, uh, William Jefferson Clinton and his cat Socks. And Socks became such a celebrity. As you can see here, all of these photographers, and he's got this expression, what the? <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, they actually uh, had him on uh, a whole, they built a whole storyline about uh, on the Murphy Brown show because the gag was supposed to be that Murphy had been banned from the Reagan and Bush White Houses because not only did she ask hard penetrating questions that the presidents didn't always want to answer, but she was also known as something of cut up and a card and always playing practical jokes. Well, inadvertently, this was her first time in the Clinton White House in the press pool. The, the cat got into her car and she drove it all the way back to the studio totally unknowingly. And so she was afraid what to do with it. Everybody's fretting because they didn't want it to look like a Murphy Brown practical joke that would get her banned again. And they had this gag where, you know, the cat's hiding because it doesn't know where it is in her office. And every time somebody says the name Socks, you hear a sound effect going, meow. <laughs> I thought I like this picture. I had to put it in. Uh, the, he, he, he's there on the White House podium by the mic, <laughs> like he's getting ready to address the press. I thought that was a really cute picture. And uh, now this is a little out of sequence, but I thought this was too good not to include because when uh, George Herbert Walker Bush died, his service dog Sully actually lay in front of his casket. And I thought that was too good a picture not to include. And his son, George W. Bush, they actually set up a Barney cam to capture uh, their dogs, uh, Scotty dogs, Barney and Miss Beasley in the White House. 
and actually Laura Bush actually had uh, a whole display, their Christmas display, their, their tree in the White House was all decorated with ornaments reflecting the pets who had lived in, in the White House, you know, before them. So, you know, I thought that was really a nice touch. And okay, here's Barack Obama. And I love this picture. I mean, Michelle was like looking, you know, you know, he's, they're such kids, <laughs> you know, they're such <laughs> boys. So they're in the, he's with Bo and Sonny in the blue room. And uh, she had to admit that they absolutely love the attention because, uh, and uh, the president joked that it was actually more, finding a dog was actually more wrenching than trying to find a secretary of commerce. <laughs> but uh, there we go on. And unfortunately, we don't have a White House pet. <laughs> uh, a Florida breeder in Palm Beach County offered the Face family uh, a golden noodle, which is, you know, uh, a golden retriever poodle mix. And it wasn't accepted. And I don't know why, because I couldn't find any statement from the White House or anything about it. And uh, so basically, the current family in the White House. Uh, this is probably the first presidential family that uh, did not have a pet since we fought a war with Spain. <laughs> so it's been a long time. But uh, I'm sure they still get letters saying, why don't you get a pet? I'm sure his pre uh, President Trump's advice saying, why don't we get a pet? You know, it's an election year. Let's get a pet. Please get a pet. <laughs> but you know, so far, no deal. Um, and this is uh, the Clinton dog, Buddy, uh, uh, having fun uh, retrieving a ball on the White House grounds. So I want to thank everyone for actually being here and show, letting me show you some of these slides. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free. Thank you, Tom. That was really nice. Very cute. Yeah, uh, I, I thought it would be a good crowd pleaser. I, 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 I really had a lot of fun putting this one together. I really yeah, did. It's nice. It's light. It's kind of what we need. They're so yeah. cute. Oh, yeah. And uh, actually, uh, the next one we're going to be doing is, uh, I call it the Republic of Fashion, which is this very fine line first ladies have to walk between, you know, representing the American ideals of democracy, but still trying to look good. And you could see where some of them succeeded and some of them maybe not so much. <laughs> yeah, so that's going to be next week at 11, right? Uh, it's actually on the 27th. So it's two 27th. weeks from now, but it is at 11 and the registration link is open for that particular product. Um, program right now. And we did want to kind of give you a preview of what's going to be happening next month in August. There'll be two uh, topics there. August 3rd, um, and both of these links are open right now. Uh, August 3rd is Homefront Cooking. And August 17th is the Gardens of DuPont. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Which, uh, and anyway, uh, the Homefront Cooking, I think you'll find very interesting because uh, uh, the subtitle is Fighting World War II from Your Kitchen Range. And it's about how Americans coped with uh, the rationing, the shortages, and, uh, and everything to help us win World War II. And uh, of course, uh, the other one is, uh, you know, also sort of interesting in its way to, because there are beautiful gardens in, in DuPont area in Pennsylvania and Delaware. And not uh, all of the gardens you'll see are DuPonts, but uh, they make up quite a bit of them. <laughs> Very nice. So thanks again. 
in our chat box just to communicate, Tom, that uh, they found that your presentation was very interesting. And um, Cheryl even said that it, she felt that it would be very good for all ages of uh, viewers versus just the adults. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. I, I think uh, anyone maybe over six could definitely, you know, get all of it. You know, Especially with uh, some of the cute pictures. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. That's up to the school board and, and the <laughs> library to decide if we want to <laughs> do something like that with them. But it would probably work with homeschoolers. You know, we should try and target that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe Melissa can actually set up a time when we're actually allowed to have programs again. Uh, because, I mean, I could always do this again. We could always try it at some point. <laughs> okay, if there's anything else, we can actually stop the share and, you know, thank you all for coming. Thank you. All right, and just a reminder that as soon as we do get uh, this presentation loaded up on our YouTube channel, I will be sending everyone uh, via your email address the direct link so you can watch it again or you can forward it on to friends. Okay. Oh, yeah, and if you wanted to know more, at the White House Historical Association actually has some very good blog posts about uh, various different presidential animals. So uh, y y you might find that to be interesting. Okay, thank you, bye. Okay. See All you right. next time. All right, thank you everyone. Okay.